Lord be with you. that's true, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Welcome to each and every one of you. A special welcome to those visiting with us this morning on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We pray that we all would be blessed and receive God's blessing as we worship him uh, and as we fellowship as his people together. I just want to emphasize at this time just a few announcements from your pink bulletin insert. Um, no Sunday school or catechism classes this morning, uh, nor next Sunday morning. Those will resume on Sunday, January 6th. Uh, I want to say thank you to the children and young people along with their teachers and leaders for a wonderful Christmas program. Uh, th this afternoon, late afternoon, mid-late afternoon, we're going to Christmas carol instead of our evening worship or grow groups uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to begin at Oak Hill Assisted Living in Hayward 315 and then follow the schedule from there on. Uh, I want to encourage you to come uh, if that fits in your schedule, if you're available at that time. Um, Seaver Van Der Esch, his health is uh, declining. Uh, and at 90, that's not much of a surprise, I guess. Um, this may be, uh, unless you go to see him on your own, it could be the, last, one, of the one of the final opportunities that you might have to see Siebert. He's mostly coherent most of the time, and, uh, and assuming that he will be this afternoon, uh, would trust that it would be a great blessing to he and Christina and our other shut-ins as well, uh, Elmer Bunema, uh, Adrian Freud, and so I want to encourage you, if that works in your schedule, to, to participate in caroling this afternoon. Uh, you don't have to have an excellent singing voice. Uh, you just need to show up and uh, join together in singing Christmas carols and songs in praise to our God and for the encouragement uh, of those who can't worship with us this morning. So I want to encourage you, if you can, to participate. Lots of other things happening in church and uh, in our local communities. Take note of the many announcements in your bulletin insert. We're here to worship our God. Let's bow our heads in a moment of silent prayer as we come before our God and worship this morning. God's greeting to us this morning, people of God, on this fourth Sunday of Advent and in anticipation of Christmas, and for all of our days, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate, may the love of God, our Heavenly Father, who so loved this world that he sent his only Son, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who comforts us and unites us to Christ and is with us always, may this good news be your comfort and your joy in this Christmas season and all your days. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. As our God has welcomed and greeted us, let's take a moment in the joy of this day to welcome and greet one another, however you choose. It is cold and flu season, so if you want to refrain from shaking hands, that's fine. team comes forward to lead us in song. I've invited Jaron and Katie Van Beek to uh, do our Advent candle lighting this morning on this fourth Sunday of Advent, so if they would come forward at this time to do that, and uh, please join them uh, as they light the, the fourth candle um, in the litany on the screen. joy, hope, and peace, these are ours, through Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ. Let us lift our hearts and our voices together in song on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We're going to sing Love Divine, All Love's Excelling, 
and then we're going to sing what's called Hymn of Joy. It's Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee with a, a little chorus added to it. Let us lift our hearts and our voices <coughs> together in song.
the last words that we sang of that hymn of joy were these. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. And maybe that's just how some of us feel this Christmas season. I, I hope that's how we all feel, victors in the midst of strife. You see, we live in the tension, right, of the already and the not yet. Jesus has come, and he's given us of himself, and we have everything we need for life and death and all eternity in him, and yet we live in this tension, and the pain of our lives, and the pain of this world, and the sin of our lives, and the sin of this world, and yet joy has come. Ever singing, march we on, we're victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. Uh, we lit a candle for peace this morning, um, and I got us mixed up here in the last couple weeks. Uh, last week we lit a candle for joy and read a scripture related to peace. Today we lit a candle for peace. We're going to read a scripture uh, for joy, and these are the words of our Savior, some of his last words uh, before his high priestly prayer in John 17 and before his betrayal and arrest and crucifixion. These are, Je are the Je Jesus' words to his disciples at the end of what's called the farewell discourse from John 13 through John 16. And this is what he wanted his disciples to know and to hear before he went to the cross. Myron will read John 16, 16 through 33 at this time. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by the little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant? said, a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer be this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I am that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. We believe at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things that, so that in me you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Thank you, Myron. If you listened and you heard, you heard several references in that passage to joy. <laughs> Jesus is telling the disciples, you will grieve and you will mourn, but it'll be just for a little while. In a little while, you won't see me, but in a little while, you will see me again. And that's our hope. That's our joy. Uh, that's our peace in this Advent and Christmas season, that in a little while, just a little while, in the face of 
our strife and our grief and our mourning and our pain, in a little while we will see Jesus and he will make all things new. He will finish what he started. And that is our hope. That is our joy. That is our peace. With that, would you bow your heads with me as we come before our God in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, it's so good on this fourth Sunday of Advent to, and on a really a beautiful winter morning, it's so good to be in your house and it's good to be in your presence and it's good to be with your people and it's good to sing songs of Advent expectation. Advent means coming. And in this season that leads up to Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus has come. He is come. He is Emmanuel with us always. And you've promised that in a little while he would come again. And though we did not see him in his first coming, we see him now by faith. And we anticipate our faith becoming sight and seeing him when he comes again. Our Savior, the one born to save us, the one born that we might have life, the one born that we might live, the one born that we might be redeemed, the one born that we might be saved. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, whose birth we celebrate again this, this coming Christmas. And really, as we celebrate his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection. We celebrate the person and work of Jesus every time we gather for worship. But we thank you for, again, another Christmas, another special time to remember and to celebrate his birth. Indeed, that you so loved this world and you so loved us, your people, that you did whatever it took. And that meant sending your son Jesus to be born, to be made like us, to be made human in every way, and that, except that he never sinned, though he was tempted like us in every way. We thank you that Jesus was born, and born in humble circumstances because he's a humble savior, but one who is highly exalted now, and one who one day, when he comes again, every tongue will confess that he is Lord, and every knee will bow before him, Indeed, he came the first time to save. The second time he comes to judge the living and the dead. And so God, help us to embrace the Savior this day and all of our days. So that when he comes again to judge the living and the dead, to include us, that we need not fear that day, but that we can stand in, in confidence on that day, knowing that the one who comes to judge has already stood condemned in our place. Indeed, he took our sins upon himself on the cross, on the tree, and bore our punishment that was justly ours, so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be free, so that we would not be condemned, so that we could walk in life and in newness of life. Indeed, Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior. In him, we have everything we need for life and for death and for all of our circumstances in between life and death and indeed for all eternity. And so God, we celebrate again on this fourth Sunday of Advent the, the love and the joy and the peace and the hope that we have in Jesus. Indeed, we have no other hope, no other joy, no other peace. It can be found nowhere else. It's in him. It's in him who is the fulfillment of your word, the embodiment of your word. It's in him who is the source of eternal life. And so where else could we turn? Where else would we go? but to turn to you and your son Jesus for life. Indeed, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection of the life. No one comes to you except through him. And so God, help us by your spirit and through your word to come to Jesus again this day and come to him all of our days that we might know him with confidence, knowing that he knows us better than we know ourselves, that he lived for us, died for us, rose again for us, and will take us to be with himself. God, we pray. For those in this Christmas season uh, who are mourning, who are grieving, who are dealing with painful circumstances, they are amongst us here, myself and our family included. God, there are things in our lives that we wouldn't wish for, or we wouldn't choose for ourselves or others as well. And yet in your providence, we confess that you're good all the time and you're good in all your ways. You make no mistakes, no errors, and we can trust you. We can trust you with our painful circumstances. We can trust you with our painful relationships. We can trust you with our children and wayward children. We can trust you with our grief and with our mourning. Your word tells us that 
morning comes for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Indeed, your mercies are new every single morning, and your great faithfulness never fails. God, help us to, to trust you this day, in this Christmas season, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Some of us uh, will, will be missing the presence of dear loved ones for the first Christmas. Some of us will miss dear loved ones for the 4th, the 5th, the 10th, the 20th, the 50th, or more. God, help us to know that by your mercy and by your grace through Jesus Christ, that those who live in Jesus and died in Jesus are alive and well in Jesus and will surely celebrate Christmas in your presence. Indeed, they celebrate Christmas and Easter and Good Friday and the fullness of your joy and presence every day and 24-7, 365, and for all eternity. God, thank you, for not only res thank you for not only saving us, your people, but thank you for, through Jesus Christ, saving this earth, indeed the whole creation as well. You've inaugurated your kingdom here on earth, and you've promised to bring the fullness of your kingdom here on earth and throughout all creation when Jesus comes again, and all things will be made new, and heaven will come down to earth, and it will be a new earth. It'll be paradise restored, regained, even better than the original paradise, the original Garden of Eden, because there will be no more serpent, there will be no more temptation, there will be no more fall. But your glory and your blessing will flourish and thrive, and your glory will cover the earth as far as the waters cover the sea. Indeed, all things will be made new and be made eternally new. God, we rejoice in the hope that we have that is not just for this life, but even more so for the life to come. Indeed, this life, whether we live 40, 50, 60, 70, or 100 years or more, this life is but a vapor, but a breath. It quickly passes and we're gone. We fly away. And so, God, remind us again as your word calls us to, to fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on what is temporary, but what, on is, what is unseen and what is eternal. That being you, that being your word, that being your promises which we see and receive and embrace by faith. God, help us to look forward to what is to come because it is beyond our wildest dreams and imaginations. Indeed, we can't even begin to fathom perfect bodies, perfect minds, perfect hearts, perfect relationships, a perfect world, a perfect creation, even the, even the best and most beautiful of our lives and even the best and most beautiful of this creation is so pale in comparison to what will be. Even the most beautiful things we see in this life and in this world they are stained with sin, but one day will be no more. All things will be made new. God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We thank you for the opportunity that we have this afternoon. Uh, if that fits in our schedule and works for us, we have the, the opportunity to sing songs of Christmas joy and peace and hope together. Uh, to praise you and your name and the gift of your son, Jesus, but also as an encouragement to those who cannot join us this morning or any other Sunday for that matter as well. Lord, we pray your blessing upon Siebert Van Der Ash as his health continues to decline. We thank you for his 90-some years of life lived. We thank you for your faithfulness to him. We thank you for good health for most of those 90 years. Uh, we thank you for the blessings of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and family. We thank you for his faith, uh, the gift that you gave him by which he trusts in you, and even now as his days are fading, by which he trusts in you and by which he looks forward to what is to come. Continue to comfort him, grant him confidence that he is righteous before you through Jesus Christ. Comfort Christina as well, her children, as they wait for you to call him home, and surely you will call him home. Uh, may he be coherent enough this afternoon. That he, he can, in his mind, and perhaps even with his mouth and his words, partake uh, in singing songs of Christmas joy. Lord, we pray your blessing as well upon Elmer Bunnema and Adrian Croyd, our other shut-ins as well. Uh, their lives are lived in much isolation and solitude. 
imagine that they could be lonely, and especially this time of year, may our presence and may our caroling today be an encouragement to each one of them, and may it be an encouragement to us as well. God, we thank you uh, that Orland Gulker could be with us this morning after a tough week, uh, last week of uh, clotting the lungs and, and, uh, and kidney infection. God, we thank you for the care that he received, both uh, locally in Sioux Center and in Sioux Falls. We thank you for healing that he's experienced and is continuing to experience for strength gained. Um, God, we thank you and praise you. We are reminded, all of us, in times where our bodies begin to fail, uh, we're reminded that all of our days, all of them, were ordained by you and written in your book even before one of them came to be. We're reminded as we think about the unexpected and in some ways tragic death of, uh, of, of, of Molly, of Molly Kisla, at 30 years old and so full of life. Um, and yet you're, you ordained her days. And while her death in a tragic car accident, we might say, was tragic, on the other hand, it's not tragic at all. Uh, for you have brought her to yourself in the fullness of your joy and your presence. She's alive and well, even as her family in recent days has grieved her death. We know and trust that they also celebrated her life and have rejoiced in, and are rejoicing in her eternal life and that they are hoping with confident expectation to see her again. God, we pray too for the family of Chris Visser, uh, who died seemingly much too soon as well in this past week. Comfort all of those who mourn this Christmas and who grieve this Christmas season. Indeed, you have promised, you've promised through Jesus uh, that those who mourn will be comforted. And so comfort those who mourn, who grieve with your presence, with the presence of Jesus, with his life, with his hope, with his joy, and with his peace, that we might know that death does not have the last word. But Jesus has the last word, and his word is life. Lord, thank you for each one gathered here this morning in worship. You know each one of us by name. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know everything about us. Nothing is hidden from you. You know what things we're struggling with. You know what, uh, what things, temptations we're facing and what sins we've committed and commit daily. And yet we hope that by your word and by your spirit that we would know with confidence that you love us so much through Jesus Christ, more than we could know, that we might embrace that love and that that love would cause joy and hope and peace and gratitude to well up within us that we might want to love you back in return and love each other as well. Indeed, the, your greatest commandment for us is that we would love you with everything we've got, all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. We confess that we fail pretty miserably in that regard. We fall short of your glory and of that expectation every day in thought and word and deed by what we do and by what we fail to do. And yet, I hope that all of us can say with confidence here in this place that indeed we do love you, not perfectly and surely not all the time, but we do love you. And we pray that, that your love, you who loved us first, that that love is growing within us, that we might love you more. And that we might love each other more, that we might love our neighbor more, even our enemy. This is what you call us to. And so God, thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for, uh, in recent weeks, some reprieve from, from, from winter, uh, from extreme cold. Um, what snow we re receive has mostly melted. Thank you for that, uh, that nourishment for the soil and the moisture. Uh, we thank you for sunshine and blue skies over many recent days. We know that winter's coming again soon. We thank you for uh, all of your provision for us. God, hear now our prayer and all of the unspoken things of our hearts and our lives as those things come to mind and as we lift them to your throne of grace. Hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. Carol Deckers, this time we give a, a brief children's message for any kids that want to come forward for that, say ages 3 through mm, 10, 11, 12, kids if you'd come forward at this time.
Let us together ask for God's blessing as uh, we prepare to receive his word this morning. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, your word, scripture is the Bible. Your word is life, grace, and truth to us. And it is so through the word made flesh, the word incarnate. The word embodied Jesus Christ, the one who is full of life and grace and truth. God, speak to us now by your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that it might be for our good and for your glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This morning we uh, conclude our three-part series on the Tree of Life. Uh, if you've been here the previous two Sunday mornings, we've, we've looked at this uh, kind of obscure um, theme, of, if you will, in Scripture. Uh, the, the Tree of Life is, is kind of a bookend of the Bible. We, we find the Tree of Life uh, first in Genesis chapter 2 in God's perfect and good creation in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in paradise, and then we see in Genesis chapter 3, following the fall of Adam and Eve and all humanity and all creation along with them into sin, that Adam and Eve are banished from the garden and they are kept from the tree of life so that they would not eat of it and live forever in a fallen state in bondage to sin and slavery to sin. And then outside of four metaphorical references in Proverbs to the tree of life where it's the tree of life is used as a metaphor for wisdom and for righteous living. The tree of life after Genesis 2 and 3 does not appear again until the last book of God's revealed word, the Holy Scripture, the book of Revelation. But in between the tree of life that we encounter in Genesis and Revelation is, as we talked about last week's Sunday, another tree of life. It's the cross. And it's that tree of life, the cross, that restores the tree of life that we encounter in Genesis to God's people in Revelation to us. That's where we turn this morning. So if you turn with me uh, to Revelation chapter 2. So the tree of life, uh, as we encounter it in Scripture, seven occurrences. There are three of them in Genesis, one in Genesis 2, two more in Genesis 3, 22 through 24. Uh, and then we don't see the tree of life again till Revelation. There are four occurrences in Revelation to the tree of life. The first is here in Revelation 2. The last three come in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22. We'll turn there in a moment. First, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. If you look back to the beginning of Revelation chapter 2, you see the context here. This is the first of the seven letters to the seven churches that Jesus uh, gives in John's vision to John uh, to, to give to these seven churches. These are seven unique and local individual churches at that time. Uh, but these seven letters are also to the whole church collectively both then and now. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole letter to the church in Ephesus. You can read it for yourself. But I want to turn to the end, uh, to the very last verse, verse 7. Hear the word of the Lord. This is Jesus speaking. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice it's plural there. It's addressed to the church in Ephesus, but yet it's also addressed collectively to all the churches, including to the churches, the church today. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the first reference to that tree of life that we encounter in Genesis 2 and 3 for the first time since Genesis 2 and 3. And its reference is coming from the mouth, the lips of the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this vision to John. And here Jesus speaks of it again for the first time since Genesis 3. And he talks about the context about it being restored and about who will be able to eat from this tree. And when Jesus says that to those who overcome, he will give the right to eat from this tree of life, I think when he says eat of this tree of life, I think he means not just metaphorically, but he means physically, literally eat. Consume the fruit from this tree of life, as Adam and Eve presumably consumed physically the tree, the, the fruit from this tree of life in Genesis chapter 2 prior to the fall. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. To him or her, this is a gender neutral pronoun here, to those who overcome. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, the tree of life will be restored to God's people. It will not be restored to all humanity. And the key in the context here, and this is fitting with the rest of Scripture, certainly, is, is this divide, right? 
eternal life, God's blessing, God's provision, God's goodness, God's grace, God's glory is not for everyone, but it's to those who hear, who overcome. And only to those who overcome. And maybe you're thinking right now you're pretty humbled by that because maybe if you're honest like me, a lot of days I don't feel like so much of an overcomer. Like I'm not doing very good at overcoming and I don't feel like I'm going to ultimately get there and overcome. Well, I think that's why it's important that we understand the whole, whole of Scripture and understand the context of what Jesus is saying here when he says to him who overcomes. And only to him or her who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And while we're thinking about the paradise of God, where, where is this paradise of God? Where is it when Jesus speaks these words to John in his vision? It's, in, it's, it's heaven. That's the paradise of God. You see, the paradise of God essentially was, in a sense, removed from earth. From the Garden of Eden and taken to what we might call, what we would rightly call heaven. That's the paradise of God. But that paradise of God, as we read in Revelation 22, is coming back to earth in all of its fullness. And that's where that tree of life ultimately will be, in the paradise of God on the new earth. But for now... It's in heaven. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This, this, this word here, overcomes, this is a really significant word, not only in this first of seven letters to the seven churches. Uh, this theme uh, of overcoming is significant to all seven of these letters to the seven churches. The Greek word here translated overcomes uh, is this. Nikao. Nikao means to overcome, means to conquer, means to be victorious. I think the NIV revision of 2011 renders this to those who are victorious. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Uh, other English translations render it conf to those who conquer. And again, if you're, if you're honest like me, there are a lot of days and a lot of times and moments in my life I don't feel like so much of a conqueror and like I'm ultimately going to conquer in this battle, in this war over sin and the world and the devil. But it's so important to understand the context here of not only who overcomes, but how they, we, or anyone overcomes. Nikao, to overcome, to conquer, to be victorious. There are 28 occurrences of Nikao throughout the New Testament. Most of them, 17 of those 28, are right here in Revelation. And as I mentioned, uh, this theme, nikao, to overcome, to, to conquer, to be victorious, it, it comes up at the end of all seven letters. Just quickly browse through with me. If your Bibles are open to Revelation chapter 2, and I think you see you have the same headings to each of the churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and so forth, so on. Look with me at the end, toward the end of each of these letters, from Jesus to John and his vision to these seven churches. Okay, so... Um, verse 13 at the end of uh, the letter to the church in Smyrna very similar and yet a little different for each he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death second death will not be hurt at all those who overcome will not be hurt at all by the second death. You see, you and I were born dead. That's the first death. We're born dead in our transgressions and sins. That's the first death. The second death is when we, as we know it, we die. Second death. Those who overcome will not be hurt at all. Not at all by the second death. Look at the third letter to the church in Pergamum. Turn toward the ends of it. Uh, toward, toward the end of it. Verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes... I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Hmm, what's that mean? I'm not going to. I'm not going to go there for now. The fourth to the church in Thyatira, verse twenty. To him overcomes and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. This is ruling and reigning with Christ. Chapter three to the church in Sardis. Uh, <coughs> verse 
Verse 5, chapter 3, He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the church in Philadelphia, verse 12, Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, to the church in Laodicea. Verse 21, chapter 3, the last of these seven letters, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All seven of these letters speak of overcoming, 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 overcoming. To those who overcome, the blessings of God are promised to you and will be yours in all their fullness, but only to those who overcome. And here's where it's so important, friends, where we understand this overcoming. Don't, don't even, don't dare begin to think for a moment that this overcoming is on you. It's not. It's not, friends. It's not up to me to overcome by myself because I can't and I won't and I never would. Neither can you. We can't overcome on our own. And that's the good news of the gospel is that though we can't, Jesus has overcome for us. And if we trust in him, we will overcome. That's his message to us this Christmas. That's always his message to the disciples in the gospels. And that's the good news of the gospel itself. That we don't have to overcome on our own. We can't. We won't. We never would. We never will. But Jesus has overcome for us. In fact, that passage that Myron read from John chapter 16, right before Jesus' high priestly prayer, when he prays for himself in the garden before going to betrayal and arrest and crucifixion, and he prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for all who would believe in him. It's beautiful. Read that prayer again this Christmas season. It's so beautiful, and it has everything to do with Christmas. But the last words that Jesus says before his high priestly prayer in John 17, as Myron read in the 33rd verse of John 16, I have told you these things. Everything he told them, chapters 13 through 16, indeed, everything really he told them throughout his three years of life and ministry, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you better believe you will have trouble. But take heart. Why? I've overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And in that statement, Jesus is saying, I've overcome temptation. I've overcome the devil. I've overcome death. I've overcome the grave. I've overcome the curse of sin. I have overcome. And if you would believe in me, you would trust in me. You would follow and obey me. You too, in me. You will overcome. That's why he overcame. So that we would overcome through him. John, who received this vision in Revelation, puts it this way in his first, first of three letters, of, uh, epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. John puts it, th puts it this way in 1st John 5, verses 4 and 5. And here he he states very explicitly those who will overcome, who they are, and how they overcome. John 5, 4 and 5. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And here it is, the question. Who is it that overcomes the world? And the answer very plainly. Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's who overcomes the world. Those who believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, they overcome. They have overcome, in a sense, already. They are overcoming, and they will overcome. Because Jesus has overcome. I think it's so key that we embrace that and acknowledge that and understand that this season. I mean, that's why Jesus came to overcome, in essence, and so that we would overcome through him. 
To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right, we got to keep going here. Revelation chapter 22. Turn there with me, if you would, to the final three references of the tree of life. And here it is now. Again, as John continues to receive this vision through Jesus Christ and through the Spirit of Christ, I'm going to read this whole chapter. It's going to take a little bit. But in chapter, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, uh, there are three references to the tree of life. They're found in verse 2, verse 14, and verse 19. So just so you know in advance where they're at, you'll hear them. But Revelation 22, hear the word of the Lord. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place in a little while. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Do not do it, for I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed, here it is again, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magis magic art, the sexually immoral, the murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from the book of this prophecy, and here's the last reference, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon, amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. And here in Revelation 22, those three verses, 2, 14, and 19, we encounter this tree of life restored, given back to God's people, brought back to earth as the new Jerusalem, the city of God, Heaven itself comes down to earth in all of its fullness, and there in this city is this tree of life. And as we said a couple Sundays ago, we have every reason to believe this is not metaphorical, li literary device. This is a literal, physical tree that was in the Garden of Eden, is in the paradise of God now, and will be restored to God's people in that paradise one day on the new earth. We will eat from that tree. And by God's provision in that tree, and certainly the tree of life that is the cross of Jesus Christ, we will live forever and be provided for forever. You've heard me say this before, um, but outside of the Bible, of all the books that I've read, and I've read several before and during and since seminary, still the favorite 
The favorite that, that I've read outside the Bible is this book by Randy Elkhorn called Heaven. It's marvelous, and it's uh, as much as I think an a, a infallible fallen human being can be by God's Spirit, I think it's very true to Scripture. Um, <coughs> And in it, Randy Elkhorn uh, exhausts Old Testament anew for everything that the Bible says about heaven and the future and the new earth and resurrection and all these things. Uh, he asked about every possible question you could think to ask and in many cases says, well, this is what the scripture says. In some cases he says, well, this is what I think. I don't know for sure. In some cases he says, I have, I have no clue. We'll find out someday. Here's what Elkhorn writes about the tree of life. What is the tree of life? After John describes the river of life, he mentions another striking feature. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding that its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The tree of life is mentioned three times in Genesis, once in chapter 2, two times in Genesis 3, in Eden, and again four times in Revelation, three of those in the final chapter. <coughs> These instances seem to refer to Eden's literal tree of life. We're told the tree of life is presently in paradise, the intermediate heaven. The new Jerusalem itself, also in the present heaven, will be brought down, tree of life and all, and placed on the new earth. Just as the tree was apparently relocated from Eden to the present heaven, it will be relocated again to the new earth. In Eden, in Eden the tree appears to have been a source of ongoing physical life. The presence of the tree of life suggests a supernatural provision of life as Adam and Eve ate the fruit their creator provided. Adam and Eve were designed to live forever, but to do so, they likely needed to eat from the tree of life. Once they sinned, they were banned from the garden, separated from the tree, and subject to physical death just as, just as they had experienced spiritual death. Since Eden, death has reigned throughout history, but on the new earth, access to the tree of life is forever restored. Notice in Revelation 22, there's no mention of a tree of the knowledge of good and evil to test us. The redeemed have already known sin and its devastation, and they will desire it no more. And in the new earth, we will freely eat the fruit of the same tree that nourished Adam and Eve. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Once more, human beings will draw their strength and vitality from this tree. The tree will not produce one crop, but 12. The newness and freshness of heaven is demonstrated in the monthly yield of fruit. The fruit is not merely to be admired, but consumed. The description of the tree of life in Revelation 22 mirrors precisely what's prophesied in the Old Testament. Listen, listen to this verse from Ezekiel 47, verse 3, which is Ezekiel's vision of the future temple. Ezekiel 47, verse 12. Listen to this, how this, this bears out in Revelation 22. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear because of the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Commentator William Hendrickson suggests, and this is a suggestion, the term tree of life is collective, just like avenue and river. The idea is not, is not that there is just one single tree. No, there is an entire park. Whole rows of trees alongside the river, hence between the river and the avenue. And this is true with respect to all the avenues of the city, hence the city is just full of parks. Observe, therefore, this wonderful truth. The city, the New Jerusalem, is full of rivers of life. It is also full of parks containing trees of life. These trees, moreover, are full of fruit. This broader view of the tree of life would account for the fact that the tree grows on both sides of a great river at once and yields 12 different kinds of fruit. Of course, even if Hendrickson is wrong in supposing that the tree of life is collective, it is reasonable that just as there were other trees in Eden, there will be other trees on the new earth. John also tells us that the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. For the third time in Revelation 21 and 22, the inhabitants of the new earth are referred to as nations. Nations will not be eliminated, but healed. But since we won't experience pain or disease in heaven, what's the point of leaves for healing? Perhaps they, like the tree's fruit, will have life-sustaining or life-enhancing properties that will help people maintain health and energy. Our physical life and death, even our healing, comes not from our intrinsic immortal nature, but from partaking of God's gracious provision in the fruit and leaves of the tree of life. Hence, our well-being is not granted once for all. 
but will be forever sustained and renewed as we depend on him and draw from his provision. Some people find it hard to understand why perfectly healthy people will need food, water, and health-giving vegetation on the new earth. It appears that we will still have needs, but they will all be met. The organic nature of edible fruit and medicinal leaves emphasizes the tie of mankind to earth, suggesting that eternal life won't be as different from life in Eden as is often assumed. There's a little bit of speculation there, if you, if you heard that rightly. Um, but what Alcorn calls God-glorifying speculation as he imagines what God is communicating to us in the scriptures about the tree of life. Let's be clear about one thing, if we're clear about only one thing this morning, and it's this. To those who overcome, Jesus will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And the only way we overcome, the only way anyone you or I or anyone can overcome <coughs> is to believe in and trust in and hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the tree of life, the cross. If we do, he assures us we will overcome and eat and eat eternal from the tree of life in the paradise of God, and one day on the new earth. And so friends, in this Christmas season, amongst all the other things that you do and have done and will do in the coming days, do the most important thing. Trust in the one who's overcome for you. Rejoice in the one who's overcome for you. Celebrate the one who's overcome for you. And in doing so, know that you'll overcome through him. And with him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you that though we could never overcome by ourselves and on our own, we wouldn't have a chance. We celebrate this Christmas season that Jesus was born and lived and died and rose again and ascended back to heaven from where he came so that he would overcome. Temptation, Satan, sin, death, the curse, and that through him, believing in him and trusting in him and belonging to him and following him and serving him, that we too would overcome. He, through him who overcame for us. God, may that be... Our, our constant source of rejoicing this Christmas season. That the good news of Christmas, the good news of great joy, is that a Savior has been born to us and has lived for us and has died for us and has rose again for us. A Savior. To save us from ourselves, to save us from the wrath of God, to save us from our sins, to save us from the curse that we might overcome. And through his tree of life, the cross, that we might be restored to the tree of life in the paradise of God, in the city of the new Jerusalem, in heaven and earth made one on the new earth, and that we would eat of that fruit. And that by the provision of Jesus Christ and your grace, that we would live forever in the fullness of joy. May that be our source of rejoicing this Christmas season and all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name and for his glory we pray. Amen. Our morning offerings will be received at this time as we respond to God's word. First for our local benevolence fund and the second for justice for all.
responded to God's word with our tithes and gifts and offerings. Let us stand and respond to God's word together in song as we sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Let us stand and sing. of God, the good news of Christmas is this, as Jesus said himself, in this world you will have trouble, and some of us know that trouble all too well, but take heart. Jesus tells each one of us this Christmas season and for all of our days that he has overcome the world, and we will overcome through him. Have a blessed Christmas. We hope to see you here Christmas morning for worship at the work. Mm -hmm. 